Good morning, everybody. Is the, is the, is the mic, mic? Yeah, the mic's on. Okay, it's very cold. All you people out there with hair on your head, give thanks. Because <laughs> us, us follically challenged people get, get very cold. Okay, I see, I see the band's already warmed up. I know we're all, we're all cold. Oh, and I also want to welcome today um, our guest speaker, Sang Kim, and his wife, Hannah. Thank you. And um, when, um, when Sang gets up to speak later on, I'll get him. He's, he's going to give us a bit of his backstory and background. Thanks, Sang. Okay, the band's already warmed up on this cold morning. Let's um, sing a few songs. Give, give praise to God. Let's stand. Um, the hymn, that's just to keep you on your toes. And to see if you, the ones who know the words, not a problem. So, yeah, that's, that's how we roll here at St Mary's. So just be warned. No, no, we're a, we're a happy lot. Um, I, don't have a, I don't really have a scripture for you today. The only the scripture I have is, um, I guess, the scripture of creation. I'll sit... Oh, see, told you. <laughs> um, I was sitting out in the backyard yesterday watching the autumn leaves... Uh, fall down and I was watching a rainbow lorikeet um, in the Grevillea and I'm um, just marvelling at God's creation and um, I just think of Romans 1 you know it says that um, invisible qualities of God are seen by what he has made so people are without excuse I think you know I mean there's the, the scriptures all around us isn't it God's creation that's, you know, I just I just marvel I just marvel at it and um, I always feel close I always feel close to God when I'm you know Sitting out in the backyard, and um, one it's, it's one time I re, when I really feel close to God's when I'm flying up in the sky in an aeroplane looking out the window, <laughs> and you think, oh, how are we staying? You know, the laws of physics, the laws of science, all of which God created. You know, so anyway, all right, let's give thanks to that great God, um, uh, who thankfully has a sense, great sense of humour as well. He's very, very creative. Um, Great, great Father, we, have, we are so privileged that we can come before you t today. We thank you for, create, we thank you for creating us um, so that we can know you. We thank you, Father, that we're predestined, that you wrote our names in the book of life. and uh, we, can't fath we can't fathom that stuff. Um, theologians argue about it and it um, just boggles our mind. But we are so thankful, Father, that um, for this creation, for this wonderful universe, Thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross uh, for us. Father, we thank you for the past week. We look forward to the coming week, and we um, do know we, we um, ask for your grace and forgiveness, Father, for any, for any sins which we've committed, because we're all um, very frail and, and fallen, Father, but we know that you forgive us. Father, thank you again. We thank you and ask for your blessing upon this service. Uh, we're grateful for our members who attend. We um, thank you that um, Sang and Kim, Sang and Sang Kim and his wife Hannah can be here, Father, to exposit your word today. And we give you thanks and ask your blessing upon the service, and that it will, will be pleasing to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if, um, open your roots and branches, and we'll go through the announcements and. Ron will have an announcement for us in a second, but I'll just see. Does anyone have any announcements that aren't in the bulletin that they'd like people to know? Okay. <coughs> Nick? Say something, Nick. There is an announcement. Oh, yeah. Jared here? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. Go for it, Jared. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, um, the Christmas Carols Committee was meant to be meeting this afternoon, uh, but a few people couldn't make it this afternoon, so we're going to postpone it to the 4th of June, which is in a couple of weeks' time. Okay? Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Okay. Um, the One Love KCC Women's Convention will be on the 26th of August. The early bird rate will end soon, so please say, see Janet if you would like any assistance with registration to attend this year's conference. Base camp will be held in Katoomba. Oh. <laughs> it's cold enough down here. Base camp will be held in Katoomba, but it gets pretty warm up there in the 
Convention Centre will be held in the Convention Centre on August 11th and 12th, 2023. The early bird, early bird rate's now passed, but it's still possible to register for the event, so please see Nick if you need any assistance. And prayer night, the 4th of June, is the 4th of June, which is next week. Yeah. Winter. Winter. Um, come and enjoy a time of fellowship and prayer. And Ron, you'd like to say something? This, this, is early, this is earlier on. I'm later on. Okay, um, thank you. I just wanted to mention uh, on the back uh, in the foyer, there's, you'll see a whole lot of these. There's thousands of these there that I was sent from Living Waters. Um, and if you know of a, of a situation where you could use those, just take a pile of them, you know, to the school or if you'd like to even put them in the letterboxes in your street. If you're feeling really brave, you could go down to the St Mary's <laughs> railway station and hand them out there even. But uh, it's uh, capitalising on the or opportunistically really taking uh, advantage of the coronation of uh, King Charles III with an evangelistic message on the back of, of that. And uh, they're quite nicely produced. Um, if you'd like to take some to your church, feel free to, to take a handful of them. There's thousands of them out there. So uh, that'll be fine. But uh, anyway, they're, they're there on the back. And there's also a lot of other um, leaflets there that you might like to just look at and, and use uh, appropriately. Shove a couple of those in your wallet's a good idea too, just to have them there. You never know when you can hand them to the bank teller or whoever else that uh, might be uh, in your purview. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ron. I could use a million bucks. <laughs> well, but uh, this is, you know, having a relationship with God. Yeah, I don't want to spend it. No, I mean, we can't, we can't put a price on what God's given to us though. Okay, now, um, where's, there he is, Ruth. That's Ruth. Now, Ruth um, slash Jared is going to come up and give us the kids' talk. Then we'll have the kids' song. And after the kids' song, um, Nick's going to come up and lead us in prayer. Right, we'll get to that a bit later. Jesse, what's up with this jar of purple stuff? I thought you were going to bring grapes to introduce today's Bible story. Grapes? Oh no, Megan! I made a mistake. I thought you said grape jelly, not regular old grapes. <laughs> That's okay, Jesse. You actually just made a new way for us to introduce today's Bible story. I did? How? Yes, you made a mistake. Some religious leaders in today's Bible story made a mistake too. Your mistake was not a big deal. You just forgot what I said. But the mistake the religious leaders made was a very big deal. They rejected Jesus because their hearts were far from God. Listen to the story that Jesus told those religious leaders. Jesus was teaching religious leaders in the temple. He told them a story. A man planted a vineyard on his land to grow grapes. He built a wall around the vineyard and dug a pit for crushing grapes. He also built a tower. The man chose some workers to take care of the vineyard and he went away on a trip. When it was time to collect the grapes, the man sent some servants to the vineyard, but the workers grabbed the servants. They hit one servant, killed another, and threw stones at the third servant. So the man sent more servants to the vineyard, but the workers hurt them too. Finally, the man sent his son. He thought the workers would respect his son, but the workers pushed the son out of the vineyard and killed him. After Jesus told this story, he asked the religious leaders a question. What do you think the man should do to those workers? The religious leader said, they should be punished. The man should find workers who respect him. Jesus reminded them of a story in the book of Psalms about builders who got rid of a stone that was important for building. Jesus said that the religious leaders were like those builders and Jesus was like the stone. The religious leaders who rejected Jesus had made a big mistake. Jesus was the most important and God was going to punish those who rejected him. 
God had a plan to use people who accepted Jesus to build his kingdom. Jesus told this story to teach the religious leaders about himself. God sent his own son Jesus to earth, but the religious leaders rejected him. Jesus is the most important one of all. When we turn from sin and follow Jesus, we get to be a part of God's kingdom forever. Okay, so it's a Pharisee or a teacher of the law, right? It could have been anybody, I realize that, I agree that. Okay, so you know that it's a Pharisee, though, because he has lots of colorful clothes on, okay? And this is what they love to do. They love being the center of attention. Um, and so this was a, a big issue back then because they weren't supposed to be that type of person, that type of leader over God's people, okay? And so everyone, all the people thought that um, the Pharisees were wonderful people. You know, if you had a child and they grew up, you would love them to be a Pharisee or someone who teaches the law who taught God's people. And you know what? God actually gave them that responsibility to teach God's people. Okay? And actually help them and guide them how to live for Him. Uh, but the reality was, this is where the Pharisees thought they really were. Okay? They were above everybody else. They exalted themselves and thought that they um, were not sinners. They were right with God. They were righteous people. Okay? So every time they go and they walk in the streets, uh, people were to, you know, um, make way for them. They were to maybe even potentially bow to them or, you know, say hi or whatever. Um, and, and acknowledge that they were better. Okay? And so this is the type of leader or the type of person that God had actually uh, told them to be. Not the type of person to look after God's people. Not the right tenants to look after God's people. And so, see, see the difference between the two there? Okay? But that wasn't how it was meant to be. Okay? And so, when you've got people um, that, you know, who have all this power, they don't want to be taken away by anybody. So, when Jesus comes on the scene, can you, um, can you imagine? Do you think that the Pharisees would have welcomed Jesus and what he was saying? Of course not. Because what he was saying was against them. So, they say something, and then Jesus would be like, no, nope, that's wrong. No, nope, that's wrong. No, nope, that's not what the Bible says. And he'll keep on saying that basically to them. Do you think it'd get annoying after a while? Do you think that they want him to get to, to be rid of him? Okay. So and that's exactly right. So um, here's Jesus, you know, preaching to the crowds. And what they would do, the Pharisees would be like, well, you know, they were asking questions, try and trip him up and try and trick him into saying the wrong thing. And so um, some of these questions, like, you know, who do you think you are that you say you're the Son of God? Whose authority do you have to say? Um, that you can forgive sin. All these sorts of questions. And by asking these questions, they actually um, come to realise that they don't really know who Jesus is. They have no idea who he is. Which sadly meant, too, that because, because Jesus is God, they also didn't know who who was. Is that the answer? They didn't know who Jesus was. What does that mean? Who else didn't they know? God. That's right. Okay? So... They were supposed to be leaders for God's people and helping them to let, you know, lead God's way. But they were they didn't put trust in God. They rejected Him. So they were wicked. You could say they were wicked tenants, right, over God's people. And so I guess when Jesus talks about this situation with um, the, the, the wicked tenants of this vineyard, He's asking the Pharisees, is it an issue? You know, do you think this is an issue that you're, you haven't done the right thing? Do you think, you know, I'm going to let you get away with this um, you know, forever? Do you think I'm just going to let you do what you want? Do you think it's an issue that they've been doing the wrong thing? What? They're supposed to be leading God's people. That's right. And were they? No, they weren't, were they? 
So Jesus sort of says this issue, you know, should we let these tenants go who, you know, just trashed the vineyard and have, you know, killed or injured, um, you know, um, not just the servants, but the, the tenants only, oh, sorry, not the tenants, the, the owner's only son. If that was your son who got killed, do you think we just let that go? Do you think you let that go? You don't turn a blind eye, oh, it doesn't matter, it's only one son, I'll just have another one. No? Do you think the tenants should be punished? Okay, and you know what? The Pharisees said the same thing. But they said a bit strongly than we did. They said this. This is their, he will bring those wretches. Hear that word? Wretches, not these tenants, these wretches. It's got more of a, a weight to it, doesn't it? It's like they also feel that they have done the wrong thing. He will bring those wretches to wretched end. When you reject Jesus, right? when you reject Jesus your whole life, and at death, if you still reject Jesus, then you will come to a wretched end as well. Okay? That's kind of the point of why he says all that. And the Bible calls that judgment. Okay? You know much about judgment, actually? Judgments, okay, so it's where we have the, we suffer the punishment that our sins deserve. And where do we go? If we reject Jesus at death, we go to hell, don't we? That's right. And that's what the Bible teaches. There's a pretty grim, wretched end, we should say. Okay? And so just remember that those who do not follow Jesus now in this life will not follow Jesus to heaven when they die. Okay? They will come to a wretched end. And the only way to avoid it is what? How do you avoid going, um, going to a wretched end? To follow Jesus, that's exactly right. So hopefully you will follow Jesus. If you want to know more about that, you can ask me. You can ask any of the elders of the church. You can ask anyone that you know who's a passionate Christian um, who can tell you these things. Okay? Um, so just remember, as we come to the end, God will judge those who do not believe in you. Okay? So let's pray. Uh, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, Lord, we know that the gospel uh, is two-sided. There's, um, there's uh, that you save your people, uh, but you also, on the other, the flip side of that is that you also judge those who reject you. And so, Lord, please help us to remember that that is why the gospel is so is such good news. Um, is because there has to be bad news for there to be good news. And so, Lord, we do um, uh, pray for uh, not just the kids, but also adults here. Um, all of us uh, who may still be wondering if we should follow you, and we pray that we may see the consequences of our actions if we end up not following you um, at death. And we do pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I now invite Ibrahim up to bring, bring today's Bible reading and then the message from Sang. The Bible reading taken from the First Corinthians, chapter 8. First Corinthians, chapter 8. Now, about food sacrifices to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So, so then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. 
For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrifi sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we don't eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of, right, of your rights doesn't become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Did you want to interview me or do you want me to? Okay, yeah, okay. Well, good morning. My name is Sang, S-A-N-G. Uh, from my surname, you might know I have a Korean background. Um, I came with my wife, Hannah, and we live in Burwood, not too far away from here, but we used to, until recent time, we used to live in Canberra, um, Betty mentioned about Calvary Hospital. We need somewhere around <laughs> close to it. Um, yeah, we moved to Sydney to finish my uh, theological study at Christ College. I am in my uh, third year, hoping to finish by the end of next year. So, yeah, that's uh, about my story. Um, yeah, let's open the Word of God, and before we do, let's pray together. Let's pray. Blessed, blessed Lord, who has caused Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may hear, read, learn, and inwardly digest them, that through the comfort of your Holy Word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of ever everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, back in my early years of Bible college, I did some trade work to, to, some, uh, to put some food on the table for my wife and myself. That's when I met this Christian mate who was an experienced tiler. He had about 12 years of experience. He knew what he was doing, and he worked really hard. And the company and the people, that his colleagues, really loved his strong work ethic and his honesty. And that earned him respect from many of his co-workers. However, despite being a Christian, he wasn't kind to his fellow Christian co-workers. He had condescending attitude towards those whose faith seemed slightly less than his. For some reason, he was proud and unloving toward other Christians. 
and this resulted in some of his Christian co-workers choosing to leave the job or avoid working with him. Have you ever found yourself falling into proud and unloving attitude? Or have you ever witnessed something like this? Just like my Matt story, we are often tempted to be proud and unloving toward our colleagues, our friends, and even to our family members. No one is immune to proud and unloving behavior like my mate. We see the issue everywhere, on the road, in hospitals, even at the local shops. But what about in the church? Are we any different at church? Are we different to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we less proud and more loving than the world? Our sinful nature often triggers moments of pride and lack of love. We may be different, but we are not completely free from such behavior. Perhaps we are humble and loving towards the world when we are still proud and unloving towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 8, the passage we read, we read Paul illustrates proud and loveless behaviors of Corinthian Christians toward other Corinthian Christians. Although we live in a different time than these Christians in the passage, we still face the same problem, aren't we? The problem of pride and the lack of love is the problem we're seeing in today's passage. As we might have realized after many repetitions already, today's passage is about the problem of pride and the lack of love. This issue was particularly between Corinthian Christians and we've read together in today's passage that the Corinthian Christians are struggling with the issue of food offered to idols. And behind this issue of food offered to idols, there is an issue of being proud and being unloving to other Christians. And these Christians have divided regarding the food issue into two camps. One camp says, I think it's okay to eat food offered to idols because they don't exist. But the other camp was saying, I don't think so. I don't think it's right to eat the food. And let me tell you a little bit more about the context. Corinth was a pagan city with many pagan uh, temples. When food was offered to idols at the temple, they had three different uses. First, they gave some portion to the pagan priest, so the pagan priest may feed themselves. Second, uh, the food was uh, sold at a local market. And third, they used the food to do the community banquet. They fed uh, uh, ordinary Corinthian people there. And since food offered to idols can be found easily at the community banquet, sold at market, uh, Corinthian Christians had very easy access to those food. And as we know, some Christians were sure what they can do about the food, but some Christians were not quite sure what they could do. When Corinthian Christians separated into two camps, Paul could see the issue of pride and the lack of love beyond the food issue. So the passage today points us to look at three things regarding the issue. First, pride and the lack of love. Second, humility and love, like the, uh, the title of the sermon. And third, God and the abundance of love. So what's the problem with being proud and unloving? I mean, why do we really think it's a problem? In this world, we are surrounded by those who are proud and unloving. Although these attitudes may not be seen as a huge problem in this world, Paul in the scripture warns us that such attitudes may cause other Christians to stumble. One thing Paul saw in some of the Corinthian Christians is their pride. When the food issue was raised, 
They did not hesitate to consume, to eat the food offered to idols. They knew that idols do not exist. Therefore, the food wouldn't make any change. And they eventually thought it's okay for them to eat the food. Their knowledge allowed them to realize what they are entitled to do. But such knowledge led to an increase in pride, but decrease in love. So in what ways were Corinthian Christians proud and unloving? Paul begins this chapter by shifting the focus away from the food offered to idols while, we, while he acknowledges his awareness of the issue, he begins to talk about knowledge, which is believed to be possessed by all Corinthian Christians. And this knowledge is not a general knowledge. Verse 1 says, Now, about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge pops up while love builds up. When Corinthian Christians initially questioned whether they should eat food offered to idols or not, they probably expected a simple yes or no from Paul. Moreover, it is possible that Corinthian Christians in dispute expected Paul to be on their side so that they can boast and brag about what they know and tell the other party that I am right. However, Paul says that knowledge pops up while Love builds up. Paul is saying that knowledge easily becomes a source of pride. Please don't get me wrong. Knowledge is good. In the Christian faith, knowledge plays an important role. We know many important things that God has revealed to us. In verses 4 and 6, if you look into your Bible, there is a list of what this knowledge is about. It is about knowing that an idol has no real existence and that there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ. It is such a valuable knowledge to possess. We need this knowledge. And this knowledge is that all creatures exist for God and that all things and all human beings exist through Jesus Christ. And knowing this, some Corinthian Christians enjoyed the food offered to idols, which was not a problem because idols do not exist. They have no power. But the other camp did not share the same belief. Each camp looked down upon the other camp. And those who believe it's okay to eat food offered to idols, they naturally looked down at the other camp and saying, why don't you understand? and vice versa. Paul is saying that proud and unloving behavior was dividing the church, not the food issue. In fact, the food does not impact anything in our relationship with God. It is just food. Eating, eating such food doesn't make us closer to God. Eating such food doesn't make us further away from God. And Paul acknowledges that the Corinthian Christians possess a considerable amount of knowledge about God. However, he emphasizes that their understanding is not complete. As he states in verse 2, those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Hearing this, we may realize that we cannot be proud of biblical knowledge we have. The problem of pride and the lack of love in the Corinthian church was causing other Christians to stumble. When Paul was writing this letter to Corinthian Christians, many of them were recent converts from pagan religions. They were still coming to realize that idols do not exist, which means only in the recent past they ate the food as a part of uh, idol worship. That's why they see it as a problem, eating the food offered to idols. When such new Christians see other knowledgeable Corinthian Christians eating in an idol's temple, they will not be encouraged. They will be so confused. It is because they are likely to have weak conscience because they're new converts. They're still learning about, about the word. 
In verse 10, Paul explains, For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to the idol? In other words, the proud and unloving behavior of eating food offered to idols will stumble newer Christians. It may be okay for, for those uh, faithful Christians, but it will certainly stumble newer Christians. Paul warns that our knowledge and our pride may destroy the weak conscience of other Christians, for whom Christ equally died and equally loved. In verse 12, Paul carefully identifies that it is a sin to provide the weak ones with a reason to stumble. And that sinning against the weak brothers and sisters in Christ is same as sinning against Christ. When I was a uni student, um, I lived in a Christian share house. It was a share house for single men. There were five of us. We happened to go to the same church on Sunday. We all thought this is just such a good idea because we lived you know, together. We shared our life. You know, we went to the same church. We listened to the same word. We, we thought it's going to be a great fellowship for us. But as we did our life together, we heard it each other more than building one another up. None of us realized it back then, but we had the problem of pride and the lack of love. There were differences in our Christian maturity. Some of us had significantly more knowledge than the others. It would have been great if we had used this knowledge to build others up, those who are relatively weak in their faith. But we were so proud of what we know. We were proud of our knowledge, and almost all our conversations caused divisions among us. We lectured one another, but didn't love one another. We looked down on others for not knowing as much as we did. Moreover, we corrected others and didn't build them up. We even made some comments like, Who prays like that? And prayer shouldn't be like that. This is actual comment that that we made to each other, which is pretty sad to see. So when I read this passage, I can understand what Paul meant when he said, knowledge pops up while love builds up. My past experience somewhat resonates with the Corinthian Christians are going through in the passage. My share housemates and I believed that it was our right to correct others. The real problem of being proud and unloving was hidden behind our daily issues. And no one at the time recognized such behavior as a problem, just as what Corinthian Christians are going through in the passage. Reflecting on how Paul deals with Corinthian Christians in this passage, the root cause of such problem problem is pride and a lack of love. It is important for us to be serious and be considerate where we are coming from in terms of our pride and the lack of love. But identifying and knowing the problem won't change anything until we also know what to do about it. So let us talk about what Paul teaches us to do. He talks about humility and love. Pride and a lack of love are big problems, but what can we do? In what ways can we practice humility and love toward other Christians? If our actions hurt others, Paul says we should avoid doing it. Since we have talked about the problem of pride and the lack of love, it is important for us to know how we can be more humble and be more loving towards other Christians. In this passage, Paul has a specific and reasonable command for Corinthian Christians. It includes a striking life example to settle the food issue and deal with the underlying problem of pride 
and the lack of love. In verse 9, Paul says, Be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Paul acknowledges that eating food offered to, food, uh, of, offered to idols is not a sin, but it is a sin to become a stumbling block to the newer Christians, to other Christians. This is why Paul begins verse 9 by commanding, be careful in how they use their right. Being a humble and loving Christian involves exercising our right with care. For instance, we live in a free country. We have the right to vote. We have the right to uh, follow some political party or politician we like. We can exercise our right to vote for who we think is the best. And we also have the right to say, you know, I, I don't think that guy is good. We can say that stuff. However, if for any reason, if for any reason, our political opinions become a stumbling block to other Christians, we should take care in how we present our political opinions to others. We need to ask ourselves whether such conversation builds up other Christians. If not, according to the biblical principle from today's passage we read, we should be careful in sharing our opinions. If, in, if needed, we should keep our opinions to ourselves. Paul's command to take care how we exercise our right is really important because we don't want to destroy our brothers and sisters in Christ for whom Christ died. In verse 12, who warns that wounding the weak conscience of other Christians is in fact to sin against them as well as sin against Christ. Then, should we really say something that's hurtful to others? Should we really behave in a way that's hurtful to others? To take up what Paul says in the scripture, are any of our political opinions more important than Christ and his people? Nothing in today's passage, nothing in the Bible says so. Thus, Paul gives Corinthian Christian and us a bold but simple practical application. Therefore, in verse 13, he says, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I'll never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. He is saying that he will not do anything that causes his Christian brothers and sisters to fall, to stumble. He is saying, it's not worth it. Just don't do it. We all have rights. We have our opinions and thoughts about things. But sometimes it is best to swallow what we want to say. For instance, this is my story. I sometimes have to struggle not to give advice to my wife, Hannah. I often give her too much advice when Hannah looks for a sympathy and love from me. It could be a man problem. I see all smiling faces. It could be a man problem. When Hannah talks about responsibilities and how work is going and stuff, I often give her advice like, you can do such and such next time. Oh, you, you could do better. Something like that, which is useless and unhelpful. And over the years, I've learned that my advice did not build up Hannah. It was not stumbling her, but getting there. She confessed one day saying, saying, I don't think I want to share my concerns with you because I know what's coming. I know advices are coming. And since then, I've been practicing saying, oh, Hannah, I don't know how you do it all. Or just carefully listen to what Hannah tells me. The Bible commands us, don't do it if what we do does not help. 
and even stumbles other brothers and sisters in Christ. Then how could we love others? We don't have such power to love other Christians. Because of our sinful nature, we are naturally not loving. And throughout the New Testament, it is evident that the power of loving others comes from God. Since we have realized that love builds up, now we wonder how we can love others. And here we should realize that the source of love cannot be ourselves, but it must be from God. The power of loving others comes from God because love is from God. Here we know uh, God is the source of our love towards other Christians. Our strength to love others comes from God. And this is pointed out in 1 John 4. John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Throughout the Bible, the most significant sign of God's love was revealed through His Son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came among us in flesh, how did He come? He came us as a helpless babe. He humbled Himself to come to us. Though He could sit at the right hand of the Father, He has His own throne, He was laid in a manger. He experienced tiredness, hunger, and the need for sleep. He was even tempted by the devil. Jesus surely humbled himself. But what prompted him to leave his throne behind and come to us? This is love. Out of unconditional love, where he humbled himself. From the manger to the cross, Jesus obeyed the Father out of love. And he, and he died for all our Christian brothers and sisters out of love. He was shamed on the cross and mocked by sinners and suffered on the cross for all the believers. His death has set us free from our sins and his resurrection has defeated the eternal death. It is the sacrificial love of Jesus that love was his motivation. And he is also a source of love for others. How did, how did it for the glory of God? Could he do it? It was love. How can we do it for the glory of God? It is love towards God and towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Knowing this, how should we respond to the humility and love of Christ? In Ephesians 5, Paul says, Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So let us be imitators of God, God is the source of love. We cannot be the source of love, but we can be the channel of God's love. God's love enables us to love other Christians. Let us be the channel of God's love. As Jesus sacrificially loved us, let us sacrificially love other Christians. We are not called to become stumbling blocks to other Christians, but we are called to build them up with love. The power of God's love enables us to love others. It is not our own love. It is not our own power, but only through the unconditional love of Jesus Christ. We have the power to love others with God's love. Let's pray. Almighty God,
graciously grant that your word from 1 Corinthians 8. Please help us to inscribe what we heard today from, from your word in our heart. Guide us to love other Christians. Guide us to love those who you died and loved the same you did to us. Father, this is so hard because we cannot love with our sinful nature. But Lord, we trust through your Holy Spirit you may be, enable us to love others because we know the love comes from you because you are the love. Father, as we live our life throughout the coming weeks, please help us to uh, keep remember your word, be able to retrieve what we've heard, and be able to ask your help when we really need to reach out to you. Because love comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sang. Thank you, Hannah. Because we know, <laughs> us men know that it, <laughs> we need a good uh, woman, good wife to support us. We can't do it on our own. Um, thank you for the message, very practical, and thank you for your personal example and um, really hit home with me. Uh, we've all got, um, yeah, we all have to deal with pride, don't we? Yeah. Okay, um, um, let's give thanks and um, thank God, we'll thank God for the offering up the back. And thank you for the band, and um, I really like. You had the chimes before, Ron. That was thanks, mate. That's very good. And the band, they, everyone puts a lot of work in. We we do appreciate it. And again, thank you, thank you for the message. Um, great Father, we uh, thank you that we can come before you. We thank you uh, for the message today. Please help us to take it away, um, because your word is practical, Father. Some things may be hard to understand, but um, today's message um, was easy to understand, Father, and very very personal. We thank you for that. Um, we thank you, Father, that we can have a part in preaching the gospel. We thank you um, that we can give, um, whether it be our time or money or uh, just of ourselves, Father, to advance the kingdom. Thank you for today's service, Father. We ask your blessing upon um, our dismissal and upon the week, and we give you thanks, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have um, say the off let's say the, the grace. May the, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and more. Amen. Let's have um, tea and coffee. And if any of you want to wash your hands on the way through, <laughs> there's a, oh, there's a hidden, it's all right, no, I'm not, it's just, I'm just being stupid. Nick knows what I'm talking about. But um, let's all get together and have a tea and coffee.